Welcome to another episode of Real Talk with Real Fit Pros. It's your boy, Jonathan Loudermilk, and I've got my PIC, my partner in crime, Mark the Fitness Ninja Zamanoff. But before I pass the baton off to my main, my main man over here, I need you to do me a solid. I need you to do all the things that everyone that has the podcast asks you to do. <laughs> all the things. All the things. Subscribe, leave a five-star review, go ahead, take a picture, put it on the gram, tag us at Fit Pro Bros. and by the way, that name is copyrighted. If we catch you using it, you owe us a dollar every single time. It's in per perpetuity into what we use. Anyway, now that we have that over with, I'm going to pass over to Mark and... We have a special guest in the studio today. We have a very special guest. And, you know, the title of this podcast is Real Talk with Real Fit Pros, and they don't get much realer right. than this man here. I'm super excited to have him. And we are, we are live in studio recording this, so uh, there's probably going to be some social media clips. You know, we had Tony Tavares on not too long ago, and uh -huh. I was like, man, this is probably the biggest guest we're ever going to have. <laughs> And uh, we, we have blown that out of the water today. Um, Tony's so, a monster. Yeah, yeah. he's huge. Um, so, so this young man, I'm going to call you a young man just because you're a little bit younger than I am. Sure. Um, he loves to pick up weight and put it down, and that is to put it mildly. Uh, he, him and his wife, Amanda, she is also a fitness enthusiast, and we'll get into their Shark Tank experience in a little bit, which is really awesome. You're like the only person I know that's ever even sniffed that realm, so sure. we definitely right. want to talk about that. He's a five-time IFBB pro champ, top 10 in the world, which again, when we start talking about learning from people and success leaving clues. We're going to extract some things out of that of what it takes to really operate at a championship level because it's very rare that people have the opportunity to learn from people that high up. Um, former firefighter, correct, yeah. and yeah. medic, mm -hmm. which John and I were laughing before. We're like, well, did you just like show up and blow on the fire? Like, yeah. <laughs> and the fire's like, ah. Right. Uh, car enthusiast, gun lover, patriot, man. Uh, so great to have you. Ladies and gentlemen, Steve Kuklo. Oh, that was a great <laughs> intro. Thank you, guys. John, Mark, I'm super excited to be here, man. Thank you. I'll follow you around and just hype you up if you want. You know, like <laughs> exactly. You're hired, both of <laughs> you. <laughs> you All guys right. could just do intros for podcasts. And by that, by uh, the way, my guess with how you put fires out was the Hulk clap. You just come in and just clap and everything <laughs> just awesome. disappears. Uh, so before we dive in, we always start with story time. Sure. So what do you Ooh. got for us? Well, this is, I was kind of asked a question, what was a, a good gym story, you know? And, and you think of uh, stuff that's happened to you, good, bad. Um, I kind of got somewhere in the middle there because uh, something that was absolutely brutal, one of those, those moments in the gym or times in the gym where you look back and you're like, man, that... That almost killed me, but it made me stronger at the same time, you know. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of life lessons that we take, it, that kind of is the, the big uh, take home to it. But so I actually train with a, a female trainer. Uh, she's a uh, previous, a retired IFBB pro bodybuilder, competed in the early two thousands. Gina Davis. She's out of uh, Oklahoma, and a lot of people are like, are you training with a chick? Like, what? And they're like, no, no, no. Just look her up online. G -force <laughs> You're like, okay, it's next level stuff. Um, and I think she, she enjoys torturing men, especially uh, guys my size. So she trains <laughs> with a lot of women and a lot of big guys. And um, I saw her take some average uh, competitors and make them really good. To me, that's impressive. Everybody can take a, a f you know, somebody with elite genetics, trade them and, and just try to make them a little bit better and still be in elite you know, even more elite, right? But you take a piece of coal, turn it into a diamond. I'm impressed with that. Mm. So it was, uh, she was coming down to Dallas. I said, let's get a training session in. Well, that same weekend was, uh, it was about a year after I was, we had our shark tank experience and Damon John was coming down to speak and invited me out that Friday. We we're supposed to train with Gina Saturday. So when Damon invites you out, you do whatever he says. Hey, we're going <laughs> to come out to the uh, event I'm speaking at, and then after we'll go out to dinner, and then probably after have a few drinks, club, whatever. I'm just going for the ride. This sounds great. You go out with him. You know, it's VIP everything. Tables. You were in a limo. I mean, it's fantastic. And then I look, and I'm like, man, it's 2 o'clock, and i got to be up at like 8. She wants to train early, like 8 or 9 or something like that. I'm like, this is going to suck. I'm like, oh, I can do it, you know. Um so the next morning gets comes around. I really don't feel like getting up. I get up, get there. You know, she's like just she's a ball of energy. She's like 100 miles an hour, 8 a.m. ready to rock. So I get in. She's like, all right, warm up. And then I see her setting up all this stuff, and I'm like, oh, this doesn't look good. <laughs> and uh, I mean, I can hold my own in the gym. I'm not a I'm not a puss. I'm not gonna, 
you know, back down any challenge. And um, so she she comes up and she's like, okay, this is what we're going to do. She's kind of lays it out. I'm like, okay, you're joking, right? She goes, no, no. Um, and it so it's called her crescendo workout. And it literally, you do one exercise for like a set of 10. And then the next set, you do a, a one exercise and another exercise for 10. And then you just keep adding exercise all the way till you get to like eight or nine different exercises but you just do them consecutively. Like, so say, for instance, it was like leg extension to start and then like squat. And then leg extension, squat, hack squat. Ugh. And then leg extension, squat, hack squat, mm. leg press. Leg extension, and it just went up and up and up. And by the time I got to like the eighth exercise, and it was something I usually can do, like let's just say like a hack squat with, you know, loaded up. I could put eight, nine plates aside. I think she had two on there, and I got to it, and I'm like, you're jo- like, this is nothing. And, <laughs> and I could barely do a rep. And then at that point, like, I went white, and I was like, that la- the night before caught up to me, and mm, it, yeah, about, yeah. it about destroyed me, you know. And I was, I was looking at a bucket, and I was like, just please carry this around with me. And there's pictures of me follow it with this bucket following <laughs> me just in case <laughs> I let loose. And I'm not one to throw up in the gym, but I felt like it. And, um, and that at that point, I was like, I looked at her, I said, you're hired. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, it, it's um, sometimes you got to push yourself past what you're, you're used to. And, and, and that was one of the times I was like, you know, she forced me to go way farther than I probably would have went by myself with my normal training partner. And, uh, and she was, you know, all, there was no like, okay, we'll, we'll take it easy this set. There was no holding back with her. So at that point, I was like, you're the girl for the job. <laughs> I love it. I think that sets the tone for the whole show right there. Like, it takes a special type of human being to go, yes, may I have more of that? Yeah, right? And not give up. So that, yeah. that, that was uh, that's it. I dig that. Um, so we will definitely circle back to the bodybuilding stuff for sure. sure. I've got a lot of questions for you. But first, let's talk about Shark Tank. Like I said, I've never met anybody who's ever been on there. I know John didn't piece it together initially that you know when we first met and we are like, wait a minute, that's that guy. Oh, yeah. shit. So tell us about a tell our, tell our listeners about the company first of all okay. what what you and your wife do and then how that whole process kind of came to fruition. Well, in the fitness industry, there's you you're there's athletes and there's obviously influencers and, and we're kind of both. You know, we've been in the athlete side for my wife and I for 15 plus years each. Um, and then with the advent of social media that kind of created the influencer side, when you're able to get in front of more people, maybe not be an athlete, but still can influence. And so a lot of brands approach you saying, Hey, um, we want you to wear our leggings. We want you to wear, you know, use our protein, we want you to wear our clothes, all that kind of stuff. So, um, we've always been approached on that. And then when my wife and I got together, I was already doing some t-shirts and basic stuff for fan, fan apparel. And, um, we decided, uh, my wife had a very solid female based following and very, you know, loyal following. It wasn't a, a sex based following. Like, Hey, you know, she's not just out showing her tits and ass and like, Hey, this is what we do. It was, it was very much based on, you know, the quality of, of content and the authenticity of, of her. So we decided to kind of create our own apparel line. Um, she was known as the booty queen because, mm-hmm. uh, put two and two together there. And, uh, <laughs> So she, we, we decided, Hey, let's give this a shot. And it was funny. We started with only like a tank top and, uh, uh, an eight by 10 that we were selling, you know, and then we were kind of working on building the brand, getting more, uh, products. And, uh, with an $8,000 investment, we started, uh, we found a legging manufacturer and started cranking out some leggings. You know, we'd run small runs, maybe 300 pieces so, sell out in a few weeks. And then you kind of start hitting those walls. We're like, oh, man, we ran out of inventory, you know, and then we're having a little lull. And so it was a kind of intro into running our own business and managing inventory and, and that kind of stuff. Um, and the, the business just kept growing and growing. And um, so it kind of created that, that scenario where it was like, well, we kind of need help. And we're huge fans of Shark Tank. My wife, you know, we were watching it all the time. It'd be on. It's one of her favorite shows. And so she just sends an email, blind email, and saying, hey, I'm going to, you know, take a take a stab, maybe get on. Because they're saying, you know, email here or, you know, submit it, uh, an entry. And they always have those those events where you could show up and pitch your business to, like, the producers in, in different cities. Mm-hmm. She sent an email in, full bio about us. And then it was probably two, three months later we got a phone call. 
And that phone call, they said, uh, we're super interested in your business. We love what you got, you know, and if you could send us another video. So we sent them a video. And it's like about an eight eight to nine-month process of getting on even in front of them. Oh, wow. They vet the crap out of you. I mean, they, they want yeah. everything from pretty much blood samples to, <laughs> you know, your left kidney and everything. But I, I get it because they say 40,000 people apply a year to wow. the or per season to the show and they only take about 180 in air 140 mm. out of those 180 so it's you, it's nothing's really guaranteed until you see yourself on that that you know that the episode so um you know we we ended up uh you know building building the brand that we we did got on shark tank that experience in itself was um you know, incredible. Like it, it, it was something that I've been on some of the biggest stages in the world in front of, you know, 10,000 people in, in, in an audience. And then, you know, uh, the hundreds of thousands that are watching it live stream kind of stuff. But then when you get in there and there's probably 50 cameras, a hundred people standing in the background, you got five sharks in front of you and you're thinking to yourself, there's supposed to be like five to 10 million people see this. And this is all done like live. It's not like in an event where, you screw up. Hey, can we start over? It's like, no, you get one shot and that's it. And you better know uh, your shit. So mm. it was done about four days after I competed in Mr. Olympia back in 2017. So, I mean, it, you know, kind of going on a little bit dieters brain, a crazy weekend before, <laughs> but it did play in my favor. Cause I was super ripped and tan. And I, it was, it was like, people were like, Holy crap, this guy looks insane. So right? <laughs> that was a good part about it. But um, at the same time, it was very stressful. Cause my wife's like, you got to know this stuff. You got to know your lines. You got to know the numbers. And I'm like trying to remember it. And I'm like, just it's falling on, you know, I felt like a, a moron at times, but other than that, I mean, it was an amazing experience. We had huge exposure from it. It went from, uh, you know, you pretty much had to take a business that was, you're just kind of starting off maybe a year into it and had to get to a point where you are like in five years in a matter of a, a month or two. So it was, it was a huge uh, introduction and, and abbreviated course and know your shit and, and hurry up and learn it. <laughs> yeah, right. That's awesome. So, from my understanding, those pitches are actually pretty long, but they they condense them they, down. They yeah, break yeah. Them we down were, like eight or nine it minutes. was. They say average is like thirty to sixty minutes. Ours was about forty five minutes. Okay. And uh, I think if you go into Shark Tank and, and offer a fair shake, you know, the people that go in there say, "I'll give you two percent for a hundred thousand. They're like, "Screw you! We're gonna we're gonna destroy you here just because that pitch that that, that offer is right. terrible." But for us, we went in. We uh, two fifty for twenty percent is what we initially went in there. Um, and so I think there was a, a professional kind of courtesy they had with us because they, they looked at us like athletes and they were like, man, these, you know, they initially were kind of shocked by, hey, there's a guy in a shorts in his tank top. We've never seen like this. And, and uh, so they were kind of in awe of, of the physiques and they were mm -hmm. really cool about it. So it kind of broke the ice initially and it wasn't as serious like. Oh man, you know we're gonna just these, these business people coming up against business people. We're gonna butt chest. They're like, oh, these guys look pretty cool. So they wanted to yeah. kind of cut it up about life and and what we do more than more so than business. But at the same time, it was um, it was a great experience because they were very um, they were they were good to us. You know, yeah. I think you see some shows where they destroy people, and and yeah. my fear was like. I don't want to either forget because the initial like two minutes, it's kind of like a pre-rehearsed pitch that you have to know. Um, so I didn't want to screw up my lines, you know, number one. And then when they asked me a question later in the show, I didn't want to actually just draw a blank face and be like, uh, I have no idea. Right. <laughs> you know, because that can happen. You see people there that they just hit like hit deer in headlights and you're like, oh man, I feel so bad for that person. Uh -huh. But for us, um, it went really, really good. And, and even, you know, getting the deal with Damon and uh, I guess you could say winning the show was a, uh, it was definitely something that's been an amazing resume builder. It's something that can relate to a, a more general person in public when they see you. They're like, oh, I've seen you on Shark Tank before, you know? Right. And, yeah. and um, you know, like we, we opened up a retail store at a local mall here uh, shortly after we were on the show and, and we spent a lot of time there and people would come by and they, you know, I wouldn't go out of my way and say, yeah, it's me on Shark Tank, you know, kind of like a badge of honor or anything. But somebody would like, we'd have some video playing in the store and they'd kind of watch it and they'd look at me like, is, is, is that <laughs> you? You know, and I said, of course, uh, you know, that's us. So it's cool to be able to, you know, talk to people. And because when people see you on TV or magazines, they get this persona like, oh, this guy's got to be a pompous asshole or somebody like they're real unrelatable. But then when they meet him, they're like, oh, he's not that bad. He's a pretty cool guy. He's down <laughs> to earth. He's one of us, you know, so. That's one of the things, you know, I, I met you at, at 
at Stuman's house the first mm. time I ever met you. And all I'd ever heard about you before was what a nice guy you are. Like, that's the first thing out of anybody's mouth. Oh, man. Yeah, I know he's huge, but, man, that is such a nice dude. And, like, I know his kids call you the Hulk, and they yeah. just they yeah. love you. And, and so it's, you know, I love seeing nice people win. Yeah. You know, that's always the a little bonus way. in the business realm. Mm-hmm. So uh, I, I, I love that story. So where's the business stand now? Um, as far as where it was then, where it is now, and where it's going. Well, it, it you know when so it took about six six to seven months when we initially filmed from when we actually aired. So mm-hmm. there was a little bit of time, but you, they you still aren't guaranteed that during that time, like you still they not, can still cut it. They can still cut it, or if they say, say for instance, if they say you're going to be filming uh, or, or airing Friday, April thirtieth, that's going to be your air date. And a president comes on, or there's a natural disaster, or weather, right. or something uh, could completely cut the episode, and and they consider that not airing, and and it really is the case because the episode just goes black, you know, mm-hmm. and and so that was a fear of us. Um, so after we air, you know, we were trying to ramp up production, get stuff ready in in anticipation of us airing. We we did. It was a little bit delayed, but you know, that's that's kind of a guessing game because you're like, well, we got a product. We, you were obviously a female baseline. It's for for women's fitness apparel. So, you know, how many, you know, do you want to, you don't want to overdo it because, you know, you can put this, say, half million dollar order of inventory in and, and <laughs> only sell half of it you're or none of it, it or something. You know, you got to, you're not sure how it's going to be received by the, the at home, you know, consumer. Um, they kind of give you some guidelines and idea of pricing. People like to generally buy stuff online um, from the show. They see it's like a 40 to $60 price point is kind of a, a sweet spot. Ours is a little bit higher end, but we tried to make it at, uh, you know, run a little sale to keep it in that price range. And so we, uh, I'd say initially the show, it just, you know, the, the website traffic, everything, it just, it just skyrockets. It's like, yeah. uh, you know, hitting a lottery for your business right out of the gate. Um, and then, it, and then it was just kind of a, a learning, big learning curve for us because people immediately assume you're Amazon is you, you, you're like, <laughs> you, you, you know, they want, they want next day shipping. They want their product now, uh-huh. you know? And I'm like, it's still just a small group of us doing this. My <laughs> wife and I, we got a small team working out of our house. We have a little warehouse. We do stuff like, so um, there's that, that kind of people are a little bit um, impatient with things, but sure. you, as long as you explain it and keep it uh, clear with them as far as, you know, expectations, they're, they're usually really good. I mean, there's times where people were really upset, sending a, a pretty mean email and you're like, man, these, these people are assholes. <laughs> yeah. But you, you know, I actually got on the phone a lot of times I would call them, you know, they'd be like, my orders in here yet, you know? And I'm like, well, we got 3000 orders in a day, you know, like give us some time. So I'd call them up and I'd just say, Hey, you know, we're working on it. And they would, they'd be super cool. Like you'd well, be yeah, like, cause Steve Cooper yeah, yeah. Fucking calling yeah. Like, you, know? you know, so that, oh, that, <laughs> so that was, um, you know, some of the cool parts of, of that, but again, it, it's been a learning process of, of business. I always say like to my wife, cause she, there's times she gets really frustrated with things just cause I, she's a little more emotional than I am. And, and you know, she's just, cause there's been some really great points and then there's some really suck points with the business of, yeah. you know, trying to get a uh, product in and then they send the wrong product or it's, or it's, you know, inventory issues and, you know, just people like not taking their job seriously and it causing, you know, you problems and time and money and, but in that, in this whole time of, of our business, I said, it, it's been a school, a schooling we couldn't have paid for, you know, in, in a matter of four or five years, we got an education that you can translate into probably 70% of it into any business and, and run any business just because of you knowing at top to bottom how to do things. And so that, that makes it invaluable. I love it. I love it. And, and, you know, again, what a great story from, you know, a few hundred here and there, kind of dabbling around with maybe that still had that vision in mind. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of people, all they see is the end, right? They say, oh, he was on Shark Tank. Well, it must be nice. And uh, it, it's just so fun to see Whoa. stuff like that grow and, and flourish. What's really cool is how you got on there. You're like, my wife just said, fuck it. <laughs> just yeah. it so, I mean, it's like if you, it, you sometimes you just got to take that step, the yeah. first step, or you got to, you know, knock on the door and see if somebody answers. And, I mean, I always say, like, what's the worst somebody can say is no. Right. Yeah. Like, yeah. you know, <laughs> for sure. Awesome. Um, so, so let's shift gears a little bit. Obviously professional bodybuilder. You've been doing this a really long time. I didn't even, I was doing some research on you. I didn't realize how long yeah. you've been doing this. The, the first show that I found was from 2004. That's right. Um, and that you were a teen then. Mm-hmm. So, so talk about how, 
how bodybuilding became a thing for you, because I know you had an athletic background. Sure. Like you're in the hockey hall of fame, which is really weird. <laughs> um, <laughs> but talk about how bodybuilding became really just part of your existence now. And, and kind of that journey from 2004 teen Steve to badass IFBB pro Mr. Olympia, Steve. I just, bodybuilding to me was always something that I had a, a true passion for and I loved. I loved getting in the gym and training, trying to better myself. Um, playing sports growing up, always uh, wanted to be the biggest, fastest, strongest guy on the field or on the ice or whatever I did. Um, and and that was the era of kind of the Ronnie Coleman, Jay Cutler mm. time and we're Mr. Olympias were still televised on, on pay-per-view. And it was like, we, I remember as friends, we'd get together, read all rent it and, and watch it. And, uh, you know, and, and I lived in Detroit at the time and the Arnold classic that happens every year is another massive show that, um, we would go to that every year. And I remember going, I think I was about 14 years old and we'd get a group of somebody that could drive would drive us down <laughs> and we would go, it's like a three hour drive. And every year we'd go spend the weekend there and you'd see all the pros. And I remember just being enamored by these massive people that were there, fit bodies and you know, the beautiful people, of the fitness industry. And I was like, man, that's, I, I just, I'm drawn to that. I, I love it. Um, obviously, you know, it's not like a, it's not like a, a major sport like a baseball or football or something where there's, you know, seven, eight figure contracts getting written out in this. But I, it's something I'm like, hmm, that, I'd like to do that on top of working on another career. So that's when I I was going to school to be an engineer for automotive world. And during that time, the, the 2008 crashed automotive industry was just in the tanks. And I was like, you know, and that's when I pursued uh, to become a firefighter medic. I got that. Well, that was kind of my base to be able to do what I wanted to do in the fitness world. Um, from there, it, and I started competing in 2004, did really well. And it was kind of one of those things. I always thought I had to be like Ray, or you know Ronnie Coleman or Jay Cutler, like Mr. Olympia to get on stage. It was kind of a fear. Like, you know, well, I'm a little 18-year-old kid. Like, I'm not near as big as I need to be. Well, I think anybody that wants to be, a, you know, to succeed or continue to grow, like there's always that can I get there, you know, mentality. And, and um so just somebody that competed that I was at a local gym mine's like you need to just do a show just just get with a coach and my first training partner was actually a coach and he helped me out and, and Justin Harrison just was a huge like help for me and um so he laid out a program for me I I literally followed it to a team and he and uh and had won the team and the team division and then like a the the place third in the open men just in my first show you wow. know people like you got something so it, it, coming from athletics, my parents were like, this bodybuilding's weird. Like, it's just a different <laughs> culture, you know? Right. Like, these people that are walking on stage half naked, like, looking, you know, but they got it. Like, they understand the competition aspect of it. My dad's a big competitor uh, as far as, like, he loves competition, no matter what. It can be playing cards, golf, bowling, or hockey. Like, he's, you know, my dad's like, if you're not first, you're last kind of thing. So yeah. <laughs> that kind of drove me always to be the best I could be. Um but, you know, the career took off really when I start getting in front of, like, the, the national judges and the pro judges um, as my, you know, going to that next level. So it was, like, state-level shows, did really well, went to national shows. And, and at the time, like, the industry was real big on, like, uh, muscular development was one of them that really did an amazing job keeping up with, like, up-and-comers and the national shows. And they would film, like, our full journey of, of prep. And it was, it was, it, it, it's changed now because now everything's on social media. Somebody, you guys can just take their phone out and do it themselves. So, yeah. right. Um, I'm a little bit old school and like, I'd rather have somebody else do it than me, you know, but at the same time, that's really what drove, I think the success of, of my career was, it was, they only, it really keyed on a few guys. I was one of the guys that were, people always watched and wanted to see turn pro. And then at 25, I turned pro at the Mr. USA um, and that was kind of one of the titles I really wanted to win to be like, oh, I was Mr. USA, you know, and, and I won the overall there. And that really just uh, just kind of slingshot my career into being, you know, one of the guys to always look out for. And, and it's just it's been it's been a slow climb to the top of the mountain. It's not like very few people could ever really turn pro and then do really well to pros. Stage. Right. You know, I, I can't think of really one that has um, in the in the recent um 
But for me, it just was, you know, every year, say, like I, the first year I did Olympia, no expectation. I just, I remember walking out on that stage and being like a deer in headlights. I was like, oh my God, like I almost froze because you see all these people, <laughs> I mean, you know, and, and then you're like, this is awesome. I was there as like a fan. I was like, yeah. wait, I got to compete. Like these guys are competing against, but I was like, this is awesome. <laughs> so after doing my first uh, Olympia, you know, it just was, it's, it's just been a steady climb ever since, you know, and then the, this last Olympia I did, I got sixth place. And, uh, you know, that kind of sets me up, okay, I got, now you shoot for that top five, top three point, and at that point, just keep trying to, you know, chip away at the top. Yeah, you know, I always admire, you know, bodybuilders, strong men, Olympic lifters, like, I know the journey that it takes, especially a guy your size, like, to build that type of mass, it just takes time, like, you, there's no shortcut to that. No, no overnight success like you said. <laughs> <in the last laughs> <post. laughs> overnight success, 20 years in the making. That's it. Um, like I remember, you know, last year, Half Thor Bjornsson, he deadlifted like 1,100 pounds. And after he did it, they showed a video of him deadlifting 600 pounds 10 years ago. Mm. 10 years that big ass dude yeah. took to add that type of size and mass and strength. So mentioning that, talk about how your bodybuilding discipline translates into everything else that you do i think you call it bodybuilding or fitness discipline i mean you guys fit pros you guys understand what it takes to to have the physiques that you want to achieve no matter what it all takes discipline i think that's one of the key things when it comes to an equation of of uh i mean ryan even teaches it into g-code stuff you know genetics like what are you going to do with it and and the, i always say the, the better you feel when it comes to your health and, and the better you're going to perform in business, in relationships, you know, in confidence, just walking around, you're going to feel, feel better about yourself. When you do that, it, you're going to, it's just going to translate to a lot more success. Um, not saying everybody has to look, walk around looking like me or be a, a top bodybuilder in the world, but if you're able to be the best version of yourself and, and that really starts with you taking care of yourself, you know, I think it's spirit, soul, body, you know, if you, you, you feed your, your spirit, your soul, and you take care of your body, you know, treat your body like a temple. It, it really, anybody that I know that has a lot of success, like it, you guys, Ryan, I watch a lot of the guys that Ryan coaches in Break Free Academy. Um, everybody's like on their game, you yeah. know, and, and it, it, you, I see the people that are really hungry and motivated, you know, they're not, they're not tired midday. These people are cranking, you know, there, there's no excuses. There's no, you know, there's seven days a week, you know, eight to 10 hours a day. And, and they're like, man, we got this. And, and I, you see it's because they got their fitness in order. And to me, it really translates in life to, to be the best version you can be, not only, f you know, for yourself, but people around you, your family, you want to be around a while, you want to leave a legacy. And I think that is done through fitness, um, you know, and, and from training properly to proper nutrition, um, even mindset is a big part of fitness too. Um, you know, there's a lot of people that, that are, you know, head cases, but you know, that you got to get all those little things in a line. And, uh, I think having a coach is a big part of that too. I think, you know, you guys train people and, and put out great information. And I think that's what you need to absorb good stuff. And, and there's a lot of bad information out there too. So right. a lot, <laughs> <laughs> that's the, the downfall of social media is everyone's ability to show how big of an idiot they are. Oh my gosh. Yes. Uh, yeah. I always call I always, the new thing. Now I say is like, there's Instagram bodybuilders where guys <laughs> will go film one set or, and then they barely train or, you know, they, they, they just kind of, it's the, yeah, there's the Instagram bodybuilder and there's people that actually apply that through their whole. Right. Right. You know. So, so you have your own show. Yeah. Like you have your own bodybuilding show that you put on. Yes, sir. So what prompted you to create that? And, and honestly, like what goes, I have no idea. Mm. Like what goes into something like that of, of promoting it and who are you trying to draw into that competition? Well, it, it's something, the organization that we're with, the NPC, it's, um, it's kind of the, the it, it creates to get to the net. So there's the NPC, the IFBB, which is the pro league, and then that all, it's a feeder system into like the Mr. Olympia, which is the Super Bowl of, of bodybuilding. So the NPC is where we all start, and there's, there is limited shows that they allow each year, you know, and, and it's kind of like a, either wait till somebody gives up one or kind of, you know, just says, I'm not going to do it anymore. So that kind of happened here in Texas. A few shows opened up. I was asked and I was like, absolutely. I've always wanted a show. So it was about six years ago. My wife and I, um, they approached us about having our own show. They said, yes. And we, um, decided, you know, we're going to take everything we, we took from our favorite shows, like, you know, the, the, 
the how nice the venue is, the stage, the uh, the hotel, um, the amenities, the different things that are there, and try to create a miniature version of, say, the Mr. Olympia feel, like mm-hmm. that good energy. A lot of you know everybody's there supporting. Um, there's a lot of shows out there and a lot of great shows. And, and sometimes the big shows that are like in these massive, like uh, convention centers, they're kind of, I would say they're kind of cold. It's like this big concrete, you know, floor yep. and it just doesn't, uh, it doesn't give off this warm feeling like, you know, and we really wanted to cater the competitors. Um, so we did, you know, go over, over and above, like giving out t-shirts, the, the, like really nice trophies. Like we don't give you a bowling trophy. Like people get those, <laughs> it's a, they're like a little metal. They're like, man, uh-huh. I just worked my ass off for four months you know, pay this, uh, you know, entry fee and all this stuff in, and, and I get a little bowling trophy. Like it's, yeah, <laughs> they throw it away. I've seen trophies throw it away, but like we do really nice trophies, um, and just try to make the experience really special. A lot of first time competitors. Um, so it's really been, it's really grown from word of mouth for us. Cause you know, we don't go out of our way to overly advertise and say, you know, you try to overly market it, but I think just through word of mouth, it's just grown every year, like anywhere from last year was an odd year, but it's been between 15 to 25% each year, which when you look at numbers for a show, if you're growing, you know, 50 competitors every year, that's a lot of competitors. That's a lot of people, yeah. Our peak year, we were at about 450 total competitors. That was right before the year before COVID. COVID, we were down about 30%, but this year I anticipate us being us, you know, back at that, that normal number. So, um, and and it's been a it's been a fun thing because I, I didn't again as a competitor I never knew what really went into a show right. so I was a little bit like oh, some of these compet- these these promoters are assholes they don't know what they're doing <laughs> and then when I look and see how many moving pieces go into this like uh-huh. now was, you're now you're one of those assholes now, yeah but but I try to be the nice asshole and, and, and <laughs> yeah. you know but competitors it, I always say competitors are a little bit brain dead sometimes it's kind of like herding cattle at shows you kind of uh-huh. you know literally lay everything out at an elementary level like okay this is where you walk this is where you sit this is where you go um but it's been a great experience and and we do it as like a family environment too because I, I literally fly in my family everybody works part is some in some part of my family in one way or another whether they're family of choice or family of origin <laughs> you're part of part of the show it's the kukla classic for a reason mm-hmm. so we got our our sixth year coming up um in about six weeks so here in uh, Plano, we have our show over at the Hilton there, and it's uh, it's uh, if you, if you've never been to a body bodybuilding show, I encourage you to go. Just to you'll you'll go there and be motivated, inspired, just by people that are up there and how they look and just the energy there. But I think if you're really interested in competing, you know, go to a show and, and yeah. learn and see how it's done, and then you know, then you connect with a good coach and then pick up you know kind of game plan from there. But I always uh, I always say it's something you have to at least see once in your life, right? <laughs> Um, and, and we'll make sure if you're listening to this, we'll make sure and get all the information and that in their show notes. Uh, so if you're local to the Dallas, Texas area, mm-hmm. definitely get your ass there or we will send Steve after you. That's right. <laughs> we, you know, great. We've had people from all over. Usually we have anywhere from 10 to 15 different states represented at our show. But we had actually had somebody awesome. from Jap- Japan two years ago compete in our show. Okay. There were fans of my wife that she wanted to compete at a, a show in the States. They flew over and, and competed. So That's awesome, man. Yeah, yeah it's pretty cool to Changing be able to. Changing the world. Changing the world. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's it's always interesting to me that the things that you don't think are meaningful at the time, how all uh-huh. those little things just slowly build up. And, you right. know, we, we talk about this a lot. And you're in the same realm of, like, so many of us in our circle are on this like high trajectory right now of, of growth, you know, financially, physically, spirit, like all of it. And sometimes all people see is that highlight reel and they don't see the years and years uh-huh. and years of work being done. That's true. And you're just a prime example of that. Like it's all kind of gelling together all at the right time. You know, you're ramping up. So, so what's next for you? Like, you know, when you, you wake up in the morning and other than, you know, you're going to the gym, like and eating something and eating a lot, a lot. <laughs> picking up weight. Put it down. Yeah. <laughs> like what's the driving force right now? What are you, what are you working towards and what motivates you to keep moving in that direction? I, I think at this part of my career, I have a few major goals. I, I, I want to win one of the major tournaments. I've been a five-time champion. I've, I've won some really big shows. But the two shows that kind of are the the uh, the legacy shows, I'm going to say, are the Mr. Olympia and the, the Arnold Classic. The Arnold Classic might not happen this year. I think just they've had issues with it being in Ohio. The one It's the big one that, that they have. They have several throughout the world, but that's like their, their staple show. They've yeah. had it for 40 years. And I just think that with everything that – like last year, it literally was the week before everything shut down was we actually competed at the show. 
uh, they actually were able to have the show because it was in the middle of like stuff starting to shut down. And a week before they told us the show wasn't going to happen. And we're like, we just trained our ass off for three months and you're going to pull the plug on us. Like it was, it was kind of like a, you know, roller coaster of emotion. Um, but we ended up, they ended up allowing the, sh- they canceled the expo, which is like one of the biggest expos in the world. They have 300,000 plus people that walk through that expo a year mm-hmm. or th- over the weekend. And then the show, they gave it a green light, which was great, but they limited it to family initially. And then they opened it up to, you know, it was a packed auditorium. It was awesome. <laughs> it's just, you know, the energy at those shows are incredible. Um, so the goal is to win one of those two shows. Um, and I feel like I'm really close The Arnold. I got third, um, and the, you know, Mr. Olympia got sixth the last one they did. So I'm kind of right at the cusp of, of pulling off one of those victories. Um, and then, you know, just kind of continue to build the, the brand of, of who we are. Um, you know, we have our shows actually. So I, I have three shows now. I have one in Texas here in Dallas and then we grew one. We have one in the Midwest. I have one in Michigan. So kind of where I grew up. So it's cool to be able to kind of put on a show back where I, I grew up. Nice. Uh, and then I have one in uh, Cheyenne, Wyoming. So it's the Yellowstone classic too. So, it's uh, cool to see that stuff grow, um, you know, and at this point I'm kind of looking, okay, it's I'm in the later part of my career. I'm 35, and guys usually compete to the early 40s. But, I, you know, kind of that 35 to 38 is kind of the sweet spot of a lot of guys' careers. So I'm like, mm-hmm. okay, I got a few years to let's just put everything on the table and just go all in. And um, it's kind of where I'm at with that. And we're, you know, my wife and I, I'm always kind of looking at opportunity or, or what could be next, you know, with, with business stuff. Um I think most of the stuff we do is around the fitness industry. Um, and that's that kind of key. It's not like I have to always, you know, change tracks and be like, okay, I got to focus on something that's say, can roofing. A lot of roofers I know here. <laughs> Tony, uh-huh. Tony's one of them. Tony, 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 roofing and then go to think about fitness. So everything's kind of around the fitness world. Um, so I think the uh, – the next steps for us are, you know, I'm just started trying to think, okay, what what's after bodybuilding, you know, and, and it's not – it, it's – Competing isn't a lifetime thing. I think obviously fitness is. So there's a lot of stuff we do that will carry on after. But for me, it's like, okay, you know, where do we go business wise from here? Um, so that's, that's where I'm at. And that's kind of why I, I partake a lot in stuff with, with Ryan and you guys at Break Free. And it, it allows me to think about, okay, what are my next ventures that, that we're going to do here? Yeah. And again, I, I think, you know, your longevity, your influence, your success, like whatever that ends up being for mm-hmm. you you're going to be successful right. at it. It's just one day something's going to fall in your lap and you'll be like, that's it. There we go. <laughs> Let's <do> roll. <laughs> and, uh, and again, all the work that you've done is, is going to propel you to that next level, mm-hmm. which is super, super awesome. Um, what else? Do you have anything like you really, you really want to like hammer home to people? Because again, like there's such a, I, I, I always go back to, it, but there's such a discipline uh, not just working out like John well, and I, I talked about this it to you. Like you guys, you guys fire some questions at me, like some things like you may want to know, or you feel like you get asked a lot from your, your fans or, or audience. That, so that's on I'll start, man. So yeah. there's a lot of trainers I meet on the, the wonderful interwebs that, you know, they want to be bodybuilders <laughs> sure. and they're kind of like what you talked about, the Instagram bodybuilders. They're yeah. not really there, but they're trying to position and pose and, mm-hmm. you know, versus, you know, there's a lot of trainers that want to build a real business and actually help people and teach them the right principles, but right. they feel like they're being drowned out by the IG bodybuilders that clearly we know who actually knows their stuff versus yeah. not. What would be your advice to the real fit pro out there? That's a good question. Um, see, a lot of guys, there's there's trainers, and, and I had this realization not too long ago when I was sitting with a really good friend of mine, Jeff Dwelly. I don't know if you guys ever met him, but he's a local trainer here in Dallas. But, but a lot of guys use training to kind of help them build or get to where they want to do with their career as like say in bodybuilding or fi- some kind of fitness venture that they want to do. It's not like they, that, that the, the training part is, is their, their kind of what their root is or what they want to do. You know, it's just like, Oh, I'm going to do trainer to allow me to do this. So a lot like, like you, Mark, you know, you, your, your studio, your, that's your, that's what you do. Like that's, that's kind of what, what you've built off of. And, and to me, it's, I think two things you got to look at to what a, makes a good trainer. Like, you don't want a trainer that's 400 pounds fat ass that's just telling you what to do. Like, I, I think the trainer should at least look the part. That, that's kind of the a quick vetting part of, of picking a good trainer. Yep. And um, number two, if, if they really are involved in their, in their clients, and I, I think it goes beyond just, you know, seeing somebody that may have had success on a bodybuilding stage or, you know, just uh, there's a lot of people out there that do one show and all of a sudden they're a 
they're a, like a trainer or a, a you know a <laughs> prep coach. And I'm like, you've done one show. You have no idea of the different body types, what it takes to really get to those levels. Um, I mean, I've been doing this for like 17 years, and and I understand the human body, how it works, and I've seen a lot of different bodies. So I, if I wanted to train, I could. But you know, I I always say it's a dis. I can't give the time that it would to right. really give to people. Yeah to, to uh, say, I'm going to train them. Mm-hmm. And, um, I, I think picking, you know, kind of to, to, to really nail in on, on what it takes a good coach, like see, see results that they have accomplished with the other, like other clients. Like I say, vet, vet the trainers, you know, see, um, then a lot of trainers that are good at, at promoting themselves about what they've done. They've showed like amazing before and after stuff. They, they've been doing this a long time. You know, I, I if number one, ask them how long you've been doing this. If somebody said, uh, six months, like, yeah, maybe start, look, look at some other places, but people that have a history of, of really, uh, working with people from all body types, like just don't look at somebody that's just training competitors. Like mm. take somebody that's that's training your average Joe and making them look good. And to me, that's impressive. Yeah, know? I love it. Turn I love coals it. into diamonds. That's it. Here we go. <laughs> Walk us through a typical day from from the time you get up till the time you put your head down. Okay. Um, especially, I try to. I think routine is is really important for anybody. Uh, from business or just trying to get in better shape. I think your our bodies love routine and love like the same times and stuff like that. So I'm, I'm a creature of habit somewhat. I, I'm not, you know, I'm always okay with changing things up a little bit or if I have to make a, um, you know, a little audible here and there, but you know, I like consistency with things. Uh, for me, I like to wake up around the same time each day and it's usually around the, when the sun starts rising. It's kind of when I feel like my body just, and I kind of just naturally start waking up. Um, so I, I follow the sun a little bit. Not, not like <laughs> or anything like Nothing that. wrong with that. That's kind of, you know, when the sun, sun starts coming out, I feel like, okay, I'm up. Um, I get, you know, I always start my day, have my coffee, to, you know, have, have, I always talk to my, I think I spend time with my wife and we kind of talk, you know, have, have an attitude of gratitude to start our day, you know, get kind of start on the right mental foot. Um, you know, sometimes we get in the word, open up the Bible or, or we just kind of, I want to hear what's on our heart. Um, and that's, you know, the relationship we're able to have and, and do everything we do together is because we always understand each other on, on a lot of those kind of levels. Um, so from there, you know, I'm always thinking like as the bodybuilder, I'm always thinking, okay, I got to eat this many times. (laughs) I've always got this timer in my head. I'm like, (laughs) okay, it's, it's uh, eight o'clock now. I had my coffee. Now it's either, you know, if I'm prep, I'm like, okay, I got to get cardio maybe for a half hour, do some cardio. And then I got to eat after that. But it just seems like I got this timer, mental timer. Like, I'm like, okay, it's been an hour and a half. I got uh, another hour or something before I eat again. Uh, so I typically like to eat, uh, right now five to six times a day. And that's kind of where I'm at when I get ready for shows. It's maybe even more like six to seven when I'm like in show prep and it's a job just eating. Yeah. Yeah. That's a thing, you know? And, but in the same time, you know, we do a lot of other stuff. So I'm, I'm involved in a lot of the logistics part of the, the apparel business and like the back end stuff. Um, so I do that work and then we have like, if we're planning our shows, I'm doing a lot of that and emails. And so there's a lot of like little things that keep me busy throughout the day. And then I always try to train around the same time. Um, lately it's been like early afternoon, like anywhere from between two and three. Mm-hmm. And then I'll train till about four, four thirty. uh, before like the rush, you know, sometimes, um, not that I don't like being around people, but sometimes people want right. to ask me questions or oh, interrupt I'm the sure. workout and, and, and I'm okay with that at times, but sometimes when you're like getting focused, ready to squat four or 500 pounds, somebody like want to ask you a question, how to build your bicep. You're like, ah, maybe not the right time, but like, so <laughs> yeah. I like to be a little more quiet when I train. Um, you know, I have some good people around me and, um, and then from there just kind of, you know, wind down. But, um, it's kind of an average day. You know, I, I, I'm not saying I'm saving the world every day, but you know, I, it keeps me busy by time. I, by time nightfall comes, man, I'm, I'm exhausted. I'm like, I could, I can go to bed, you know? Well, and, and you know, how many times have we heard gratitude? Yep. I mean, we cannot hammer that home enough. And, and I mean, there's, there's clinical research studies now that show the power of starting your day off with gratitude. So I'm so happy you mentioned that because like, I'm a very grateful person naturally. I just yeah. I've kind of always been that way. And it's the reason that I have the attitude that I have and that I usually have a smile on my face. And look, you know, again, if you're listening to this, you got first world problems. You know, you, you don't have problems. You got first world yeah, problems. Like, right. You're not wondering when you're going to eat. You're not wondering if your family's going to be persecuted for their religion. Like, well, that's true. You know, yeah. I mean, we, we have it pretty damn good. So, you know, yeah. maybe your, your, your worst worry is you're going to have to get a, uh, 
anal COVID test or something. <laughs> you know. Yeah, right. That is what it is. Yeah, I, it was kind of cool. My my pastor said something this past weekend that talked about gratitude, but he's like, you know, there, there's a lot of negative people, or there's times where maybe a negative thought comes through you, you know, and and you just want to kind of go down that rabbit hole. You may have watched the news, and the news puts you in a funky mood, you know. Um, and he said, you know. You can't have negative thoughts if you start if you, if you start having a thought of like gratitude or, or being thankful for something. So right. if, if something's coming on you, like man, I'm this sucks or this is going on. But then if you you know you're focusing on so, just like a, a moment in time. But if you start thinking of the things you could be grateful for, like man, I got a roof over my head. I'm breathing. I, I'm alive right now. Right. Or, or you know like yeah. life's not that bad. <laughs> like start being thankful for the things you have instead of focusing on the things that may not be. Or may not have. Amen to that. All right. So I have a few fun questions right. as we as we wrap this thing up. The, I'm really curious about this. <laughs> what is your favorite cheat meal? I'm a salt and fat guy. I'm not like a – there's a lot of sweets. I'm not a sweet guy. Um, I could take or leave. I have a bite of a cookie, and that's it. Like, I don't need the whole pack of Oreos. But uh, – I'm a burger fry kind of guy. Yeah. And, my man. And, and, my uh, man. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you touch my heartstrings. <laughs> um, I, you know, it, and when I'm not like preparing for a show or if I'm, um, say, maybe get a cheat meal or something like that, and, and we travel, sometimes I like to try out like the, the city we go to like try their best burger. Like I'll research mm. it, get online or Yelp, like, you know, best burger in Pittsburgh, you know, and, and then, you know, I like to compare and, um, and I usually stick to basic. I don't try to like go foo foo and add all this stuff. Cause I'm like, you know, give me a good baseline of where we're at here. You know? <laughs> it's like, give me the buttermilk pancakes before you add all the shit on it. Yep, you know, yep. cause then I could just, you know, assess where we're at. Uh. <laughs> have you ever, uh, have you ever attempted the Kenny's burger challenge? No, I have not. I feel like you would do well at that. They have this seven pound burger that's like on a giant Texas toast bun and it's got mm. chili and fries and oh, cheese. And yeah. All the things. A nightmare, it's a, it's amazing. I actually, I, I did that once. Um, when I was in, uh, when I lived, uh, my appetite is crazy. Cause my appetite, when I was like in my early twenties, I could probably eat this table. Like it was, I, I was, it was insane. Like now I just, I think of life and maybe stress and, and doing it, focusing a lot more other things. Um, my appetite's not quite what it was. But I remember um, I went to, there was a diner that where I grew up in Detroit that, that had like a, it was a burger the size of like a pizza pan. And it literally was, you know, but fries, but it was insane. It had to be a five or six pound deal. And I ate the whole thing. <laughs> and I sweat all night. It was, it was, ter- I felt pregnant for two days, yep. but it was awesome. I had the meat sweats <laughs> and a food baby. Meat sweats. If you had to pick another career yeah. and something you haven't done before, what would it be? Ooh, that's a that's a good question. Um, another career, probably a. Uh, this sounds awesome. Probably like a race car driver. You know, Ooh. like either NASCAR or something. It, it, I like adrenaline. You know, and and uh, if you get a taste of going fast, you know, it's, Ricky Booby. That's it. Yeah, <laughs> um, I think that would be pretty awesome. That's cool. We need to get a video of you sliding into a NASCAR. I I just want to see that happen. I'm actually I, I'm friends with uh, uh, BJ McLeod. He's a uh, he's he, he's got his own Xfinity team, and he actually drives in a, in a NASCAR circuit. Yeah. And uh, he's a big boy. He's like two forty, two fifty, and most guys are sub two hundred pounds, usually right. probably in that one seventy, yeah. one eighty range. But he's one of the bigger guys, you know. And and people see him and they're like, man, it, it can't be a driver, you know. Sure enough, but I mean, he's he's in there. But then. Um, you know, the way those guys train and how they're they're able to kind of maintain, you know, their, you know, I always say, like, you know, you get in a car, you drive fast, like, your adrenaline is pounding. Like, you're like, man, but they got to do that for, like, two, three hours straight. Uh-huh. And just hold that, like, adrenaline and not, you know, be able to control their emotion and, and how they, you know, because, you know, if you get that adrenaline dump, you're like, man, I'm ready to go to bed. Like, this right. Is, like, I'm ready to sleep, but they got to stay focused, so. Yeah, I think it's, it, that'd be a pretty awesome uh, career. I love it. I love it. <laughs> All right. Last question. Yeah. If you had a billboard that you could put a message on for everyone to see what would be on the billboard. Ooh. I'm staring at Ryan's billboard it says kick ass, <laughs> <laughs> man. Um, I think you know, kind of summarizing a lot of the stuff we talked about today, you know, kind of going in, in the, the, the gratitude and, and talking about uh, being the best version of yourself. Um, I, I think, you know, I say, um, 
maybe in life, cut the fat of life, meaning mm. like, you know, the stuff that is negative, the stuff that is just like weighing you down and, and be an energy producer, not an energy Ooh. consumer. I like that. I smell a new t-shirt. <laughs> yep, yep. We keep getting these t-shirt ideas. Yeah, right? Hey, don't a worry. Company. I'll take a royalty deal on that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think that if it, it, um, I start applying that recently and I'm like, man, that's, that's so true. It's, you know, anytime that, um, you know, energy producers are people that walk in a room and, you know, like they're there and, and the, there's like people there's a draw to them. You know, people that are energy consumers, people are like, I don't want to be by them. You know, right. like you, you, you be the person that people want to be around, mm. you know, and, and I always say, you know, treat people like you want to be treated. And that's, you know, I think that's where the nice guy comes off because I, I want you to treat me good. So I'm going to treat you good. Yep. So, yep. yeah. It's yep. a lost art. It, it is. But yeah. it's good to find people that still do it. <laughs> I love true. it. So tell our listeners where they can find you, where they can follow you, how they can buy apparel, like all, all the things. Yeah. Um, well, I'm just Steve Kuklo, K-U-C-L-O. usually get butchered by a lot of people. But I mean, it's pretty simple. Um, through social media, at least the ones I still have. Uh, I got booted on Facebook and Twitter. They didn't like, I guess, my views. <laughs> um, oh, the suck. Yeah, I got I got targeted. Um, but that doesn't exist, though. That that stuff, you know. Yeah. That, that's just. Of course uh, not. No. Um, no, but uh, yeah, Steve Kuklo on IG. I, I do have my my fan page on Facebook. That I still interact with. Um, and then my, you know, we have our show, the Kukla Classic, coming up. So if you're in town or around or want to check out a bodybuilding show, um, May 29th here in Dallas. And then um, uh, the Booty Queen Apparel is the the apparel line my wife and I have. So slowly, uh, we're just continuing to grow that and figure out, you know, the direction we want to take that. And and um, that's that's kind of what we do, you know, right now. And then we got you know Ryan's event coming up, MDM that yeah. we'll be speaking at too. And it's cool to be a part of. Uh, what you guys do and uh you know i'm honored to be involved in a lot of you know i could i see like we again we talk about fitness and how it carries over a lot in life um i'm i'm seeing it now like you know i think being able to speak on success of life but how i've done it just through that's that grind like mm. grinding it out and and uh you know able to encourage people that may not be wanting to compete but in business and like man okay you could see where where grind and work ethic really takes place in life and how important it is to have. So awesome, man. Yeah. Dude, thanks so much for coming on. Absolutely. I appreciate the man, shit it was out a of blast. you. No, you guys gave me the, the mic. I never talked this much, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that is the goal. That's the goal. Um yeah, thanks, man. You know, uh again, I'm just I'm honored to have you on here. I know John appreciates it as well. And uh anytime we get to hang out with good people, it's always a good time. Absolutely, man. So I, I, you know, look forward to helping promote this for you guys. And uh, thanks for having me, man. It's definitely an honor. Yeah. John, take it home, buddy. And be like my man, Steve Kuklo. Go get what you're worth. Damn it. Yeah. Damn good show. Damn good. Damn good. <laughs> <laughs>